All right, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Future Ear Radio Podcast. Today, I'm joined by the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Mike Andriosi. Mike, how you doing today? Thanks for coming on the show. Doing great, David. I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So, um, wanted to have you on. You've had a rather uh, illustrious career, um, you know, with your Beltone franchise, and uh, you know, I think you're one of the most, um, one of the have one of the best success stories of, uh, you know, that I've encountered within this industry. Um, so wanted to have you on and just let you kind of tell the story of how, you know, the, uh, the Andrew Osi family built your, um, your franchise and, and, you know, we can talk through some of the lessons learned along the way, knowing that there's probably people out there that, uh, could, could learn a lot from you. So why don't we just go back to the start? You can walk me through how the, your, your family kind of wound up in this line of work. Yeah, great. And and again, great to be here, Dave. And, and I think what's so amazing about our profession that we're in is that um, there's so many great stories and so many great people in it. And I think one of the things that makes me love the profession so much is the relationships you develop with so many people along the way. It's like one big family organization. And, and that's really kind of my story too, in, in some respect, coming from kind of the large Italian family in Rhode Island. Um, my father, Rocco Andreas, he was 90 years old, still uh, alive and well and doing it pretty amazing. Um, he, he, it's funny how he got in the hearing aid space. He was actually um, shoveling. It was a bad snowstorm in Rhode Island. He was shoveling his driveway and he noticed across the street that there was an older gentleman that was struggling to, to shovel his driveway. He went across the street and started helping that gentleman without asking him just to clear his driveway. And the gentleman said, what are you doing? He said, I'm just trying to help you you know, shovel the driveway. He goes, well, I'm not going to pay you to do this. He goes, you don't have to pay me. I'm just trying to be helpful. The gentleman said, well, that's really interesting. You would do that for someone? He said, yes. And he says, he goes, you know something? I'm in the hearing aid business, and I think you'd be great in this business because of the way we help people and don't always expect a lot in return, but it's all about giving back. And that's really what it kicked off. My, my dad went into interview with a gentleman named E.J. McElroy, McElroy from Rhode Island who owned a small company called Community Hearing Aid Centers. My dad went in and interviewed with him. He was working at the A&P supermarket as a, you know, a, a struggling father of a few kids at the time, way back when. And he got into the hearing aid space that way through helping someone uh, through, through a, a challenge. And um, my dad uh, was perfect for the business um, in, in a sense that he loved helping people. He loved developing relationships. Um, and someone who didn't have a tremendous amount of education, this was a good field at the time back in the, uh, the 60s to, to get involved in at the time. Um, and so he became active in that business and, and worked for Community Hearing Aid Center for quite a while and ended up buying the business for Mr. McRoy. But as a kid, uh, I'm one of six children, I'm number five or six kids. All of us, all my brothers and sisters at some point were in the business somehow, whether we worked on the weekends with my dad or just went to the office with them, probably no different than you, David, with your, your business with Oak Tree. Um, but with, with me, um, I have two older brothers who are both doctors. One was an audiologist. I uh, didn't like audiology. Was had a hard time selling Harry Gates in the seventies for five hundred dollars. So my dad said, "Well, lower it to four seven five. He still couldn't sell him, so he became a family doctor. Uh, so it wasn't his wasn't his racket. My other brother Mark's an Anderson third doctor today, very successful, pretty amazing guy, um, and, and worked for my dad for a while. My sister Kim uh, worked with me and through the hearing aid business for quite a while with my dad, and just recently retired. Um, I had a sibling, Victoria, worked for a little while. My brother, Eric, was the smart one and became the investment bank. I really never did much with the business except help with some accounting systems. But me, I was always passionate about it for whatever reason. As a, as a young kid, I would um, go into the office with my dad and uh, uh, on weekends or uh, at nights and sell batteries at the front desk as a teenager. Um, at the time, we started doing significant amount of marketing. We had this old, clunky mechanical machine called an address, addressograph machine, which was in the basement of one of our main office. And I used to go down there and run these plates through the machine at 14 years old and print out all of the monthly newsletter we called the sound facts that we'd ship out to 10,000 people every month. And that was my job as a teenager, but being around the office and seeing patients and seeing the other people in the office, it just became part of you know who I was to be, to, to be around it so much. So I always had that interest uh, for sure. Um, when I was 18 years old and just graduated from high school, I passed the hearing aid dispensing license in Rhode Island. So I was the youngest hearing aid dispenser license in the state. 
um, and then went out to college, the University of Rhode Island, where I, you know, I, I started uh, studying communicating disorders, hearing and speech, um, and also speech communications. But going through college, I still worked for my dad every single, I'd say three, four days a week, fitting hearing aids while I was going to college. I used to sell hearing aids at people's homes. I used to work in the office. I used to, so it was just embedded in me so much that this business was something that I, I really was passionate about. I love the people that we took care of. I love the gratification we got when you changed people's life, even back in those days where technology was so primitive that it only moved the needle a little bit, but even that little bit was pretty good. But I was always somebody who was technical and, and liked the electronic aspect, but I could explain it to people so it was very simple for them to understand. So that I think that made me somewhat unique in the space. Um, and, and really just kind of left it. But what really kind of set me up to be kind of next level, I think, within the space is that my, my dad was running original Miracle Air franchises back in 1985 when Miracle was just franchising. He was one of the top first 10 people to sign a franchise agreement when Miracle and decided to franchise within the space. And when I graduated from college in, in 88, doing the five year fraternity plan, I, I might add, uh, they, uh, uh, the best year was that last year. But uh, <laughs> the, uh, I, I really, at that point, started um, really diving into the space much deeper. And, and, and what I mean by that is that Miracle had a management training program that I attended when I was a young person, learned so much. It was a week-long training program in, in Golden Valley, Minnesota. Learned so much about running a business. Uh, what was the, the metrics back then to make it work with the telemarketing aspects of it that we used to use back then, the sales training, the sales management stuff. And that kind of really... Uh, layered on to what I learned when I was a teenager, when I went to um, Hal Fishbein's sales training program when I was 16 years old with my father and, and attended Roy Bain's training, sales training programs and Frank Ring at Starkey's sales training program. So as a young kid, I, I saw all this. And then it just, when it got to Miracle Air, it kind of clicked with me in a sense that this was a, a very structured franchise program that I had never seen before that had a lot of really smart people in it who had just got into it. So I had these incredible mentors at an early age, you know, my twenties, early twenties, um, you know, people like um, Ed Alio and Don Gross and Don Ellsworth. And it's funny, Rick Frazier and I, it was the big miracle. Idea. Him and I started exactly the same time at Miracle Air. So, uh, it, and there was Jeff Dahlberg and Ken Dahlberg. This, this Miracle thing was so unique because of their lead generation program. The people that they had involved in it was was pretty magical, and they, and they kind of treated it like a big family business in some sense, even though it was a large uh, franchise system. And the systems they taught, I really enjoyed. I, and, and said that when we were trying to grow a business, keeping things simple, I think, was the most important thing. So one of the things that came out of that was that we sold one line of products. It was only Miracle Air at the time. Our pictures were 72 inches off the wall. They were three feet apart. They were all the same pictures. The furniture was all the same color. And, and ordered from the same company, the copperting and, and in the store was a very, you know, all the same. So all our stores in a franchise environment all looked the same. It made it very simple to then scale if you wanted to scale because all the systems are in place. And I really kind of liked that for for uh, for one big part of me. And I really liked what Miracle was doing as far as their sales training, um, inspiring people, inspiring leaders, getting people together on a regular basis. Um, they were they were really ahead of their curve, and then, you know, they started something that really special. I mean, everybody in, in the industry at the time would have people walk in their office if they weren't a Miracle Air dealer, and people walk in and say, "I want that little Miracle Air one." That became like the Coca Cola of the hearing hearing industry back then, because it was an incredible lead generation program. But you know, what was interesting is, um, Jeff Belt, excuse me, uh, Miracle Air then sold the business. To Bosch and Long. So Bosch and Long purchased the business from them um, back in, in the um, late in the early 90s for a substantial amount of money. And Bosch and Long, being an eye cured company out of Rochester, New York, really felt like, hey, listen, we can take what we know in, in optics and optical and turn and, and layer this into the hearing aid space and kind of make this go, you know, a large scale because everyone thought that the hearing aid business should be a lot larger. What they found out was that hearing aids weren't sexy nobody wanted them it cost too much money and people will put them off buying them for years and years versus eyeglasses or uh, sunglasses where they were sexy looking people wanted them they made them look younger uh and they were appealing so 
they were convinced they could take that optical mentality and applying it to the hearing aid space. But boy, did they run into some roadblocks. You know, in the in the four years after uh, Bashalam bought it, um, I saw five different precedents from Bashalam, all from optical industry, come in and try to run the hearing aid division. And that was just frustrating. It was really frustrating in the sense that I just really didn't align with any of the people who were trying to run the business because everyone in New York at that time was so hearing aid minded. You had these outsiders coming in and trying to change the whole philosophy. Of it. Ultimately, it didn't work. Bosch alum had to sell it the yard sale or kind of for, for uh, to Amplifon with the Italians who, who got into the space at that time. And I had already exited. I exited Miracle. I just really didn't like the, the management team that was there at that point. It's kind of funny because a year later, after Amplifon bought it, they, they, they called me and said, Hey, uh, Andreozzi, you're the only uh, uh, Italian that we see on the, on the, on the, <laughs> with a vowel in your name. Why did you leave the company? So that was a whole other conversation. It's funny. <laughs> um, but it, it was interesting, you know, in my perspective, to see something that was going really good and then something and how fast it could change. And really, a lot of people at that time in Miraclear exited out of the Miraclear business because they didn't like the culture. They didn't like the message from above. And you had this machine that was so well oiled and many, many people leaving it. So it was a great lesson for me in a business perspective to see, you know, how you could mess something up. And I, I said to myself that that's something that is not going to happen to me if I grow my business because I really, because culture, family, promises, um, all those things that are really important in the business when you're, when you're trying to grow it are, are so important. A lot of those are broken um, and it just didn't feel right. So that's kind of, I exited the, the Miracle of Business like in, in uh, about 98 and then I became multi-line for a while with Siemens and Starkey and worked really close with those companies. Um, uh, they, they were great. They were, you know, going back to multi-line business was fine. Um, had some great relationships there, but that's when I first, um, kind of encountered, uh, uh bell tone in 2001, they had approached me with an opportunity and they had been, um, bell tone had been sold to GN, no different than miracle had been sold to, um, Bashalam, but GN bought this bell tone business and really kind of messed it up. To be honest with you, they went from doing a lot of hearing aids selling about 50% of that volume because of the, the company that came in changed just the whole philosophy of how the business was working, broke up that kind of family uh, momentum, if you will. And you had all these bell tone dealers leave exit that went to Audible or they went to a multi-line practice or they went you know elsewhere. And it was really a catastrophe. And I, in 2001, when bell tone approached me, they were really down and out. Um, they had a, a, one of their larger dealers in Florida who had just uh, kind of missed, uh, left them and left a disaster in Florida. They, they kind of hired me as a private consultant to come back in and try to open up some stores in Florida to combat what happened. Um, and I did it. And, and, and I opened six stores in five months in Florida, two days a week, flying back and forth and hired the staff, put people in place, built up the offices, got it up and running literally across the street from all those stores that I had just abandoned uh, uh, the belt on system it was kind of a message, if you will. Um, and, uh, it, it, and it went so well, the folks at belt on said, Hey, we'd love to work with you in a larger capacity. And that kind of kicked off my belt on uh, world. Cause, um, they came to me and said, listen, we're going to do the first concept we've ever thought of. It's called a mega dealer. We want you to be our first mega dealer. I said, well, what is a mega dealer? Well, <laughs> there was still, I think that they were still designing what it was, but at the time, <laughs> um, they, in the New England marketplace, they had a lot of uh, belt tone folks that had exited as well. Um, and they wanted to open up a lot of stores in a short period of time. So basically, I signed an agreement with them to, to be partners with them on, on a, a new business to open up you know, 25 stores in five years, which were very ambitious plans at the time. So we did that. So I, we went back and, and uh, we did that in less than two and a half years. It didn't take five years. We did it really fast. Um, we did it by scaling a lot of the things I had learned. And what I, what was interesting to me is when you come into a business that you don't know a lot about, I didn't know a lot about Belton at the time. I thought they were just like what I left at Miracle, which was more of a, a franchise system, which would be, um, uh, colors, pictures, carpeting, uh, uh, you know, a distinct retail model. Well, the, the, the Belton uh, message or program at the time was more a distributorship model, not a franchise. And that's the big difference in the businesses 
that we see today in the, the businesses you deal with, David, oak trees, that some of them are structured so that, um, you know, they have a similar pattern in each one of the office locations they have. Others, they let them go. So at the time, Belton was something that really didn't have a, a true uh, image across the board. There were some offices that were old and, and, and just needed to be done over. There were some newer ones. It was stuff in between. Um, so when I came into Belton, one of my missions was right away is we're going we're gonna to cookie cut this. We're going to design a program, an office look, uh, an image, uh, you know, a whole culture around it. And that's what we're able to do in our New England stores in a short period of time. In fact, it, it was so special that people were calling and come work for us because we were building beautiful offices. We were doing great advertising marketing. We had a great reputation with, with the teams out there, the people that worked for us, that came on board with us. And they wanted to be part of it because whenever you start a business and you get something going, people want to be part of something special. You know, we live in this world of, uh, in this industry that it's kind of it can be a boring industry. You work by yourself in an office, it might be you and your, your patient care coordinator, and that's it. You might have a manager or somebody working in an office, but that's, you, you got four walls around you. You have to find a way to continually stimulate people, get them excited about coming to work, make them feel part of a mission that you, you know, that you have going on as well. Um, and that was a, that was something that we were able to do at a very, very, I'd say large scale. And, and, you know, that was because we would meet with our teams on a regular basis. Every month we had a staff meeting, no matter how big we got, um, we'd fly them in if we had to on a regular basis. We would have sales contests. We would have uh, ways of communicating without, outside of that, that, that monthly meeting. But in person, it was important. We would eat together. I would make myself um, so available to learn about the people that worked for me. I wanted to know about them. I wanted to know about their spouse. I wanted to know about their family. I would be out to dinner two, three times a week with different people that worked for me just to understand what they were all about. So then I could design a, you know, a custom program for them, whether it was an incentive program or sales program that suited their needs, that was very special to them. Um, and we were good at that. And that people felt connected with the, the organization that way versus just cookie cutter, you know, everything out there. So that was that was really big. So I, I would say I took my family, my background in, in an Italian family of loving people, showing them love with food, being great uh, to, to be uh, with them and, and, and making sure they felt important. And I applied that to the business we were growing. And I think that really worked, you know, very, very well, uh, not only with the staff, but our management team and everyone around it. So we, we grew this thing really big, fast, Dave. It was really amazing how it, you know, how it all went from just three offices that, that I kind of took from uh, in 2001 and made that, uh, we grew that to over 125 stores um, over those years. And we did it in 10 different states. Uh, and a lot of the people that kind of helped me do it were the folks that uh, worked for me in, in, in my belt on office that became managers and then became partners in some of these areas as well. So everybody had a, a hearing aid background. Right? I was I was very um, persistent in the fact that anyone was going to come work for us, how to work in hearing aid office for a while, how to learn the business for a while, how to know what it's like to sit in that chair, to know what it's like to deal with the patients we deal with, because that is not an easy thing for you to dictate that from above. And not ever actually have the position within it. It's unfortunate because it's it's important that you understand those things. So that was those are some of the things that we did. We took that small family business, made a larger business through scaling and by using kind of you know great family values in that regard. Well, one thing I want to just jump in here um, is you know I, I feel like we've kind of seen this time and time again where you have the uh, some sort of outside large entity comes in says. I have this grand plan for how we're going to just completely, you know, uh, expand and reimagine hearing healthcare. And I feel like you probably had a, uh, you know, firsthand witness into all of this time and time again, it seems to fail. And so I think to your point, um, you know, the, the most successful people I've ever come across within this industry seem to be the ones that are most deeply immersed into it. Um, they, they really understand intuitively how this works, what some of the inherent challenges are. Um, and and so I just think it's interesting to hear that this dates all the way back to, um, you know, the uh, the days when Miraclear was first bought. Uh, and I'm sure there were other um, shades of this that went on, but I mean, we're still seeing this today. 
uh, where you know now you have like consumer electronics companies that are coming in and they're just assuming that oh this is such an easy challenge to solve it's a technological challenge uh, that we need to solve or something like that and there's just so much more to it um, and it's it's interesting to just kind of see this thing the same pattern time and time again play out it's so true and you know what you know the history really teaches us lessons for sure what what we do with those lessons is really determines what we're going to do with our business so you got to pay close attention to those history lessons and i know um what's happening within the within the profession today is no different that is a race to find a way to own some of the retail and because the retail is really where where the rubber meets the road the reality is that's true but the most challenging part of our profession is the retail side of it learning you know, audiology and retail how can you scale at, at any size um hearing the retail or audiology practice so that you can do it in a successful way. It's easy to buy at stores and we see it all the time. We just saw Alpaca and Phone make a deal recently. Hearing what continues to buy stores. Um, I bought lots and lots of stores over the years. But what I noticed was that when when we started growing and, and get making large, you know, when we started getting to be a bigger business, I looked around and what I saw that there was nobody out there anywhere near our size at the time, but we were really the largest practice around. And I think we kind of motivated some other folks to become, uh, you know, look at this on a larger scale and say, hey, maybe we can grow a business. Well, we just kept our eyes on the road and, and did our thing and, and used those values that I, as I was, I was saying to you, was, which is about your people and the culture. You cannot buy a culture. A culture comes from within. When you develop a culture, then it's contagious. So you have to find a way to develop a culture that works for you. Everyone's different. Everyone's got a different fingerprint. I just sold my business recently, as you know, and the person that bought it, Brian Snowden, who's wonderful, his fingerprint's going to be different than mine. He'll find a way to keep that culture that's really important to him. If you're a large manufacturer and have, you know, you're part of hundreds and hundreds of retail stores that you own today, it's it's really difficult for the for the organization for and for the people that work for you to feel connected with you in some kind of way. And it takes a special art form uh, that sometimes it's hard to explain how to do in order to do it. And there's some people that do it really magically and there's others who just do it the wrong way and they treat it like a very large corporate entity. And people just don't like that within our profession. Our, our businesses don't run that way because at the end of the day, it's still a business. It's a people business, one-on-one. -on -one. And what happens in all those stores is between the, 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 the hair care professional and the patient across the table. And if that peer care professional doesn't believe in the organization they're with and, and all the values they have and the products and stuff, then it's going to get lost in translation and the, and the sales will just not dictate that. So I think it's really important that you develop certain things within your business that make you unique. Um, and we had so many of those things in our business that made us unique and have fun with that people today still talk about that, that you know, that, that they have a good time. I, I got one example, it's a great one, is that when I used to go out and visit our stores, the first thing I would do is I would go to the, the restroom, the bathroom in the office, and I would make sure it was perfect. I would make sure that off the bathroom was absolutely spotless, like you'd be proud of it, like it would be in your own home. And I would take pictures of the bathroom, and I would then tweet it, or I would email it to my whole team and say, hey, I was in Brookfield, Connecticut today, and this is what their bathroom looks like. And that whole thing, and I was very serious about that because I think if you go to a restaurant, hotel, whatever, the bathroom sets the whole presence for the rest of the place. If the bathroom's clean, then the kitchen's probably clean or the rest of the room's clean. Same thing in the hearing aid office. It should be just as important that if someone uses your restroom and it's beautiful, then they, then they, they know you, you have attention to detail, that this is important. So that little silly thing just amplified such a large level. When I went into offices to visit them, unexpected sometimes or expected... The first thing they would do is, is Mike, they need to go check out our bathroom. It's not. <laughs> they couldn't wait to show me their bathrooms. And and it was true. And uh, and today, if you walk in any of those bathrooms, they're always spotless. We took it to a next level. We had um, we, we had a contest about who could decorate their, their toilet paper dispenser the fanciest, just like you would see at a Ritz Carlton or something <laughs> like that. And people would come up with these flowers and designs. And I would go in and kind of rate some of those things. It would sound silly and funny, but it made it kind of like something special for them to do they would take pictures of it send it to the other people they would took pride in their office just simple things like that were so important and there's other things you can do but it, that was one of the funniest ones i think 
and I love still it applies today. Yeah, I, I do. I think though that um, you know something I've really learned from you is the uh, you know how how were you so successful? Well, I think one of the you know common denominators is your attention to detail, and like you said, is fostering a really good culture. Um, and I think that those things are dis- they're kind of wildly dismissed as just sort of like uh, afterthoughts, but you know clearly you did something right, and I I just think that those kinds of things in aggregate. Um, they add up to something where it does actually make a difference in the patient's eyes. And we're talking about, you know, that the, the business, this whole business is more or less um, a competition of the experience that you're providing the patient, you know, and, and um, you want that patient. You know, I think you can attest to this more than anyone is like, you know, going back to the days when you were working with your dad, I can only imagine what the hearing aids were like back then. So you had to stand apart in some way. And I think it's a lot of this stuff. It's the company culture, it's the attention to detail. And then it's all obviously the way in which you interact with the patient and that experience that you're facilitating and creating continuity and consistency with that, that you can then scale, um, I think is what really makes this thing, uh, what, what makes it tick. It does, you know. It, it's a good, it's a good remembrance uh, what you just brought up with my dad. As a, as a young guy coming into the office, when I was really watching my dad, what he was doing, and I worked with him in the office and stuff. I can remember. You're going to think this is crazy, but I can remember him bringing in certain foods and dishes for certain patients. I'm telling you, there was a couple of patients who loved his veal and peppers, for example. He would make sure that he cooked those that that night or the day before. He'd bring in, and that that patient would be in there, and they'd say, "Hey, I made you some of my veal and peppers." And the patients thought it was the greatest thing in the world. His seafood risotto, his pasta, his, all these little the food things, which were so important in my life and my family. But he would give those to patients, certain patients, and he kept these little index cards on every patient this before computers. And he would you know, profile them like what their dog's name was, where they liked to go on vacation, their favorite food. And before the, you know, that day, he would have, brief himself on all those things. So he was so prepared down to the food, which was crazy. And and I found myself doing it when I was a private dispenser for a long time, doing similar things. And even in my own practice, when, again, the the, the, the whole um, aura of being brought up the way I was, food was the number one thing. And, you know, that Sunday we would, I would, you know, cook meatballs and sausages and strawberries and pasta and all stuff. I, that's how Meatball Monday began in our <laughs> I was going to ask about Meatball Monday. <laughs> yeah. I would cook like a crazy man on Sunday, not because I... It had to just because I was loved it. It made the house smell so wonderful, and all that food, which it was in my wife and my daughter, and they thought I was crazy. I would bring all that food to our corporate office. We had about thirty people in our corporate office, and the, the phone people, the you know, the call center, all the managers, all accounting, finance, all the operations folks, and I would bring all that food in on Monday, and that that was that's how Meatball Monday became a real big big thing in our culture within our organization. And literally, we had management meetings at nine o'clock, and people would be eating meatballs, drinking coffee, which became actually normal in our business, which was funny. Um, but most, some people would think we're crazy. But and then we would send, you know, I post pictures of the meatball doing something at Bell Town and how that was part of our culture. And then every staff meeting we had, we always had to have meatballs. And then people wanted my meatballs. And then if they won, we'd have sales meetings where if you won, uh, you know, certain sales, I would deliver the meatballs to your office and make a big deal out of it. And people would go crazy just to win that contest for me to come up and deliver the meatballs. So, and that's turned into a kind of a, a life of itself, the whole meatball thing. Because now we do meatball reviews and it's a whole funny thing. But but again, back to something different, something unique. Um, I know that a lot of vendors like an oak tree where all the, the marketing companies used to come visit us on a regular basis. They would try to come on Monday so they could have meatballs, which was really funny. And a lot of them would actually kind of imitated or kind of duplicated in what we did where they had food uh, a lot of times it was meatballs uh brought into their offices on monday thinking that you know that was a good cultural thing you know, and it worked for so many people that they knew that the owners cared about it for me that was a way for me to just show the love of my team through food and you know and that that was just something that came natural to me but you know i had so many people that worked for us come to our house for dinner with my family to get to know me and me to get to know them taking them out boating taking them out golfing, you know, too many people, I think just expect if you have a job, it's a job. It's not just a job. It's, it's, a, it's about really getting to know the people that work for you 
So to your point, when they when they're in the office working for you, they know there's a mission there. There's a, there's more than just a job. They're there because there's a purpose to it. And I, and I really feel that's that's kind of the missing art form in our in our profession today. Finding a way to duplicate that, you know, in some way. Yeah, I think like um, you know, just from our my personal standpoint, um, it it is all kind of the little things. I think, and it's uh, creating a company culture. I I couldn't. Uh, agree more. I mean, I think that's something that my parents really installed here um, was the sense of camaraderie, that there's a common goal. You know, we're very transparent with where we are as a business. Every single day we write the sales number uh, during our morning meeting and we just kind of talk about what happened in the previous day, um, which is something that I, I learned about from you uh, recently that you mentioned that you do these, um, you know, kind of like thoughts from Mike or you you write your you know, you kind of chronicle like, you know, here's keeping a finger on a pulse, which I think is an amazing um, leadership uh, method, I guess, if you will, to to capture kind of like what's going on in your head. And um, I, I'm a big fan of, of putting my thoughts to paper as well. And I think sure. that that's a great way to communicate um, on a, on a routine basis with your team to just kind of keep them in the know of like, here's what I'm sensing, here's what I'm seeing. And I imagine that that's fostered a, a ton of great dialogue. So you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. So one of the, the communications, the key of an organization, making sure that you're connected with those people. So when you get to a large scale of a lot of offices and you're, you're across different states and you can't see everybody on a regular basis, which to a guy like me drives me crazy. So I'm so, I'm so touchy feely about trying to get to know people, but doing it, leveraging it electronically now is, is, is very possible. No different than what we're doing right now. Um, but w one of the things we did, first thing we did is we had our, um, a belt on today show, which was every Monday morning, eight 30 in the morning, we had our belt on today. And that was a live broadcast from our headquarters and work Rhode Allen. It would go out to 260 employees. Um, and it was like that. It would, we, I kind of copied it from the today show, basically, uh, you know, NBC. It was a half hour. It was compact. It was just short snippets. But we'd be live broadcast. We, had, we built a small little studio in, in Rhode Island. And we'd do it just like we're doing here. You know, I would have a segment of it. Brian would have a segment of it. Our, our sales uh, VP, Doug K, would do a piece of it. Our, our, our VP of marketing, Tisha Williams, she would do a piece of it. Or whatever. We, we might have some of our staff members who've had some great success stories in the field in front of patients share some stories. So that was something that was done every week. Uh, that everyone was expected to be there. And if you were late, I was literally pissed off because I felt like, listen, if you're signed up for this job and I ask you for a half hour a week to make make it there, and we would log everybody in. If they were late, I would call them. I would call them the next, like, within an hour after the meeting say, why were you late? This is the one thing I asked you to do. Be respectful of it. And, you know, I didn't ask a lot for a lot of people. I asked them to watch this because it was so important to me that they understood the pulse of what was going on in the organization. So that was one thing we did, you know, I think fairly well uh, in that broadcast. The other thing is um, I had something called Thursday News and Notes, that, which was a uh, kind of a, a one-page or two-page newsletter I would write every single week, and I still do today, which was something that was really what's the pulse going on within the profession and the industry. Um, what's going on in OTC? Who's making moves on it? What in what what new products are being released within the industry, whether you know, obviously we're a belt on practice, but I was very interested to know what was going on in Phonak or Starkey, Otica, all those great companies that are out there. What's going on? So we knew when patients came in and mentioned some of those things, my team was well aware of it. And then just some thoughts and philosophies about motivating our team uh, on a sales stand, uh, from a sales standpoint, about life, about reflection, about, you know, who, who you are. And, and so when I, when we announced at the belt on conference about a month and a half ago that I had sold my business to Brian, I would share this newsletter with all the other bell town owners. And I must have had 50 of them come up to me and said, please tell me you're still going to do the news and notes section because we share that information with our teams, with our staff. That's real important to us. And, and you know, one of the things that, that I've been able to do now after selling my business is to, you know, take over this position with bell town part time as they as they call, they call it the brand ambassador, which is basically. I'm working part-time for Belltone to help build the brand and build the name of the company and bring some more people in and give some guidance to the management team about how the operators, the owners and operators out there work. They, they form a, a kind of correlation in, in a positive way, which, which is going really well. But we're continuing doing that, those Thursday news and notes things, because it's important. I don't think there's anyone really out there 
that I know of that is kind of doing that kind of stuff to their teams to keep them informed, to keep them in line with what's going on, to keep them motivated about it. Again, communication is so critically important. We can over communicate, but let's make sure we communicate properly that that hits certain highlights with people that get some ha- excited about coming into their office and stuff like that. Again, I, I, I repeat this a few times. It's a lonely job being here yeah. dispenser. And I think it gets it gets overlooked. It really does. Do you have finding a, a way to keep them tied tied in is important. Do you have a um a preferred um setting that you like to write your newsletter or your two pager is it like in uh, your backyard do you are you a creature of habit or do you just kind of do it different uh, wherever you are you know some i could i can um as the week goes on i kind of compile some some bullet points of things that i see um and, and i'm all about life experiences i'm i'm the kind of guy that goes out of his way to find a great experience and then and then and then write about that experience it could be a hotel it could be an airline person. It could be uh, somebody just, you know, buying a coffee and one me watching it across the table for somebody. So, you know, I, I get these ideas in all different ways, shapes, and forms in all different professions and industries and try to apply it. I, I do have to be sitting in front of my computer. Um, like I, I'm coming to you from Florida today. So I had a sun's in my head here. Um, but um, but it's, it's I, I do have to be sitting in front of my computer and kind of dialed in and have kind of a, a clear thought process. If there's other things going on, it's distracting to me at times. So this is the one time during the week I try to clear my head and think through it. And then I, I, I try to find something that applies to everybody, uh, no matter what scale of the business you're in. If you're in the management team, if you're a front office assistant, if you're in a call center, if you're a, a practitioner, a dispenser of hearing aids, no matter what, who you are, something that I think that that would apply and that you could, you would you would find interesting in some respect to to your life in, in some way. So those are the things I look for. And there's, there's so many great things out there that you can gather, but I try to gather myself. I try to really find things that happen to me and then I can apply to other people because I think a lot of them are just overlooked um, a lot of time. And you know, one other thing I want to mention, Dave, is uh, talking about being unique and different and special. The other thing that I think really attracted people to us to come work for us is that we weren't afraid to try things that no one else was doing. For example, we uh, we started uh, incorporating the jitterbug phone in our hearing aid practices 10, 15, 10, 12 years ago, where we actually had sold a jitterbug cell phone in our offices that would trap an older adult into the office and then we could talk to them about hearing chip. You know, I had a partner in that business. We, we ended up being in 1,400 locations across the country, outside the box thinking, and, you know, a vertical. Um, I was involved in the 3D laser scanner company, 3D systems, which got sold to Resound and then get sold again. Um, but ear scanning, unique, different, something you can capitalize on. Uh, we were the first company uh, in the United States that, that started uh, sell, uh, distributing or making available caption call phones in our offices with caption call. No one had really corporate them to hearing in office. We, we were, when they allowed marketing in that, we were the first of its kind to kind of do stuff like that. And then trying to apply you know, some of the AI technology that's available today to really look at your data. That's one of the things that, you know, Brian, who I sold my business to, he is a brilliant guy. And one of the things that he really is fantastic with is looking at data and applying it to what we can do to make our businesses better. So we found really some very interesting um, points in some of our data and, and then layered it with some other outside things to kind of help with our marketing and advertising and stuff like that. And then we even... Incorporated put robots in our offices. So we we had these B robots, which we'd use as front office assistants. We had three of them and we'd ship them to different subs. Some was going to be away for a week. We didn't have any a PCC in that office. We'd ship this robot that was on wheels that had a screen to that office. And that office robot um, would become the front office assistant. A sister clinic could run it. And that wouldn't interrupt the, the, the hearing care professional in the room. Every time someone opened the door, the robot would talk to the person, interact with them. And it was someone else's space, a PCC from. So we we did all these out of box thinking to do things, but people who worked for us thought it was just tremendous and thought it was different, and they loved it. So you know, I really stress to anyone out there who's trying to grow the business, find things that are unique, that are different, that other people haven't thought of, and incorporate your people into some of the thinking with along the same lines, and get them thinking about it because they'll think about it for the company rather than themselves, or you thinking about it for yourself. They're thinking about it. On a larger scale, how can I make the company better? 
And I think that's something that's really important these days. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, so with the, you know, kind of thinking back on your your career up to this point, um, knowing that there's probably some people listening to this that just have um, a lot of career left in them and a lot of they're probably going to fail and learn a lot just like you did. What are some lessons that you've learned that really stick out in your mind um, as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, as somebody that's just operated in this industry for as long as you have? Um, you know, what, what kind of comes to mind with, with maybe some things that others could avoid if, if they were to just kind of, if you could impart that wisdom upon them? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I would say the number one thing that comes to my mind is just what your your God given abilities are as far as what you think you could do with your practice. If you're a practice owner and you have one or two or three locations, what have you, and you have the ambition to open a large scale organization with you know ten or fifteen or twenty offices, you have to be make the uh, you have to look in the mirror closely. And really understand what abilities you have as it relates to, um, you know, multitasking about how you are with people skills and people persons and problem solving. The number one thing is, is how good of a problem solver you are and not being reactionary. And I think I see it too often in too many people that people think they're good problem solvers, but they're, you know, a lot of times they, they cause a, you know, a whole steer of things that, that, that occur and it ends up messing up the environment and the people that are working with you. So that's that's a big one. But you need to be able to uh, have the ability to to really rate how how much of a person you are to be able to do something like one of the things that you and I talked about a while ago was that, you know, I, I have this kind of crazy God-given ability that if I meet somebody in the hearing aid space and I spend 10 minutes with them, uh, a number appears in my head over on their forehead. And that number is basically how many offices I think they can operate successfully. Um, it, in the hearing aid space and be be good at it and uh you know there's numbers that that could start at one and they'll go past one and there's others that can go to you know 25 50 or 100 depending on the person it takes that first special person so but so i'd say make sure that you know what your abilities are because i think today a lot of manufacturers uh, will give you the money to to grow your business at a large scale but what good is that if you're, if you're setting yourself up for failure? And I know too many people have done that. So you have to make sure that you are, you have the abilities. Let me try to get out of this one. Uh, you have the abilities to, um, to, to be able to, to be that person that can do it at a larger scale. Um, then you just have to understand the people you surround yourself with. Because in order to do anything at a, at a larger scale, you definitely have to have great people around you that, that think like you, that might even be smarter than you. Uh, in most cases, they should be have skill sets that you don't possess because I know someone like me, an entrepreneur in mind, there's a lot of you guys out there right now and girls out there that have this entrepreneurial mind. You don't like the details sometimes. Sometimes you just like the visionary thinking that goes along with it. Well, the details are important. You have to have a mix of that or you have to have someone by your side that can fill in those blanks to make sure that you could, you know, you don't bankrupt the company in a year. You have to be able to balance things out quickly. Um, the other thing is, I think you have to you have to find what things within people, what skill sets people have that you can really kind of hitch your wagon to. So you might meet some people within your organization that you kind of had, you know, I would say segmented for something within your group. Then you find out that's really not what they're best at, but they can do something else a little bit different or on a lot much larger scale and better. Then then find a way to incorporate that into what they're doing because. That's going to make them more excited, make them more comfortable, make you more successful for sure. Um, the other thing is just having the, a, a vision for anything you're doing. So when you want to start a business within this profession and, and get it live, you need to have a mission statement for what you're doing. You need to have kind of develop a what I like to call an you know, operating system. We we at uh, Belton, New England, in North Carolina, and Florida, and New York, and all the different areas we had, we use something called the um, EOS, Entrepreneurial Operating System. And that was a, a book that was um, Brian Stone had read uh, by a gentleman called Gene Whitman. And that book was really a catalyst to, to our business because we were growing, growing, growing. And then we came flat for a while and we couldn't seem to get off that plateau. Well, after we had involved in the entrepreneurial operating system, um, that we brought an outside consultant in who was part of this whole thing. And he worked with us for a few years and really identified strengths and weaknesses within our organization. 
and try to find a way for us to get up to it. And after that period, we grew again at a large scale. So making sure you design a, an operating system for your business that has, you know, ability to scale up and get, they get larger in some respects as well. Um, and then just the other thing is just being able to be good at recognizing what's for people and, and, you know, understanding what's good in some people. I think that's a lost art form, Dave, today. Uh, I, I, I was going to say that the, uh, the thing that kind of like really resonates throughout all of that, um, is people. And I think that, you know, one of the things that I really took away from AAA, like, uh, there were two big macro themes that seemed to kind of be in every discussion. One was, uh, TPAs, you know, third party insurance. Yep. That's just in a giant elephant in the room, but the other is staffing. And I think that, you know, and it's all different types, you know, it's, um, from audiologists to hearing instrument specialists to front office staff, there's just a shortage, you know, and it's like, um, I think that people are really struggling with this and it, you know, throughout this whole conversation, this is kind of something that's just been lingering in the back of my mind, which is people are so important in both finding the right types of people and then identifying what those people should be doing um, and, and focusing on that so that you're not necessarily you know, putting them in a role that they're not really well suited for, or you're not um, giving people the opportunity to elevate. Um, because I think that that's probably a solution to a lot of people's challenges is that you need to grow and cultivate, um, you know, your own workers in, in a way that they can, you can upskill them because it's so hard to find people today. It seems like that are, um, that are good workers and, and are suited to, to do, um, the kinds of things that I think a lot of people are looking for. So again, I think it just totally reinforces this notion of you got to have a really good company culture. You got to create a place that people feel like they're part of a broader mission. It's not just about themselves. And how do you foster that kind of environment? I just feel as if everything that you've said and talked about throughout this whole conversation resonates more than ever today when it's, you know, we're, we're kind of living in a time now where we don't have the luxury where there's you know, all of this labor readily available, I think people are really challenged with that. And so I think that this is a lot of what you've been talking about, um, you know, even though it might seem sort of um, just like, you know, oh, of course, that's common knowledge. I need to yeah. make sure that I hire the right people and I need to make sure that I'm cultivating leadership and all that. It, it's, I think, way, way harder uh, done than it this. It is, you know, and I think what's interesting one of the things that, that, that I would say was a very impactful um, finding that we've had in the last few years and bring, bringing people on within, within the hearing profession. For example, when you want to bring on some new hearing care practitioners, you know, obviously the audiologists are out there and there, there's some great ones, but there's not enough for them coming into the field to satisfy the, the growth of the industry. So the AUD things really kind of has funneled it to a point where it's just challenging. So um, sharing share professionals are, is really the largest growing aspect of the field. I know I'm, I'm the incoming president of the International Hearing Aid Society and really passionate about what we do at IHS. And one of the things is how do we grow that? How do we bring more people in? I know from my own business standpoint is that because we could not bring people who were already licensed within the field, man, bring them from the outside in, we were really successful with people from the cell phone industry because they had a tremendous, you know, um, uh, experience with dealing with customer service. We were really successful with people who worked for Enterprise Right to Car, for example, who had that really great management training. And it was a, you know, it was a BSC kind of thing, uh, which was really good. We, we did not do well finding people in the pharmaceutical industry, for example. I'll tell you why. Uh, you know, you have a lot of people who were getting laid off from pharmaceutical jobs who were high end professionals who had a lot of experience. But they're always B two B. They were always dealing with the owner of the, um, you know, a, a doctor. They were representing a pharmaceutical company or a medical device company. They were dealing with the owner of that of the of the, or of the practice, what have you. When you had a deal, when we had put those people in front of consumers, they were never very good at it. That out, there's exceptions to that rule. I'm going to say that, okay. But the vast majority was not successful for us. Those folks ended up being more in the manufacturing side, doing B two B kind of thing. So, so when you're looking for people, look for people who have great customer, customer service skills. We've had some, some of our best people have been people who waited on me in a restaurant, who were great servers, who just, they were part of my story on Thursday about, 
hey, I met this person. She blew me away. She was so good. Her attention to detail. And that person came to work for us and has been for a while. And we got a number of those stories. So find people who are great at the customer service side of it. Then you have to obviously make sure that they can do the skills that are presented with a hearing chip practitioner because that's, you know, hold on the skill set. But making sure you don't cut any corners when you train with people. I know in our business in New England, we had our own Belt on University training program. That was six weeks of classroom which was a long period. And then they would you know, feather into uh, mentoring and mirroring people and stuff like that. So it was a long time, a long process. It took them months before they get sit for a license, but we really trained them very, very well. We set themselves up for uh, for success versus some of the people out there, hire someone, train them for a week and put them out there. They can't do that. This, this business is much more technical and, and much more skill set related than that. But I, again, I think identifying people who have great people skills in our profession, our industry, you're dealing with mostly older adults who really like to sit down and interact with you, who need compassion and handholding a lot of times. Look for those people that have those skill sets. That's really the key to it. Uh, and I think you'll have some success with it. And um, another thing about uh, about AAA, as I was just there in Seattle and obviously I swung you out there, was it's interesting to see um, you know the over-the-counter hearing aid folks that are trying to enter the space, most of them from Asia, uh, in the last conference we did, we just had, there was a area that just had a lot of um, uh, Asian influence of, of uh, manufacturers. And it was interesting for me to see that really very few people from who were in the hearing profession, we do this a long time, had any interest in going up and talking to them, which was really funny. Uh, because, you know, we really, there, there's OTC devices available that we have ability to get. And OTC really hasn't moved the needle in our industry. It's it's been a great public relations type thing to make people more aware of hearing loss. But at the end of the day, professional care is still really the most important thing. There will be people that obviously buy those devices and that will continue. But having professional care, so I, I honestly, I, I thought it was kind of interesting to see just kind of looking from afar what happened with that. I'm sure you kind of noticed the same thing. Yeah, you know, I think it's um, like I alluded to earlier, I think the much much more relevant conversation that's actually being had is around the third party insurance, uh, you know, vendors, at least in this channel, you know, OTC might end up being successful in the more direct to consumer channels, maybe big box. Um, I'm hearing rumblings of people trying to, you know, get into the pharmacy uh, area and stuff like that. But um, within the professional channel, I just think that it's not fully thought out um, because I don't, I think that the professional looks at it and says, okay, wait, you know, you're, it just feels very much like you're trying to fit a square peg in a round hole where you have, um, you already have like types of devices that exist that are prescription hearing aids that are roughly around the same acquisition cost as an OTC device. So it just is semantics and how you label it. It's over the counter versus a low end prescription hearing aid. And the thing that really stands out to me that like as time has gone on is, um, you know, there, there will probably be a self-serve market, a do-it-yourself market. I don't really question that. And I actually, I encourage that. I hope that happens because I think that would actually grow the funnel, but I yeah. think it's becoming abundantly clear um, that the vast majority of people and the, and really the true value isn't the widget, it's the person. It's just like you said, you know, you're talking about largely a generation that sort of comes from a time where it's all interpersonal skills. They want you to know. I mean, the thing that like really resonates throughout this conversation is the story about your dad having a Rolodex and he's got little, you know, notes about the different types of recipes that he should be making for those people. I mean, if, if that's, if you can take that to heart, like that's how you will succeed. This is a word of mouth business. People are going to come away from that and say, wow, like, this person really impressed me and amazed me and I'm going to go and tell all my friends and vice versa. If it's the opposite, you're going to say, this thing sucked. I had a horrible yeah. experience. And so I just look at this and I say, um, I think that at the heart of everything is people and the people skills and being able to create an experience that wow people and makes them feel that they are heard. Um, because so much of this is they just want to be able to describe what's going on with themselves. And they want that sounding board that I think that the hearing professional provides. And that's why I think that, you know, I'm 
I've seen the numbers and the workforce data that like, you know, Amin and Lonnie and Victor Bray have put out where it shows this giant spike in the hearing instrument specialist. The hearing instrument specialist, the audiologist and the audiology assistants like these should all be working in concert in Sapatico. They all complement each other beautifully. They're not each other's enemies. And so I think that if this I think that if this industry can kind of rally together and figure out how do we all sort of like play a part here, because there's so many people that need this kind of help. And I'm not really sure if the solution is just I'm going to just give people lower cost widgets because that already exists. I think what we need is more points of access to make this person to person experience more readily available. Couldn't agree more. And, you know, you mentioned, you know, how this integrates into pharmacy and how some of the, um, you know, some of the direction might be going in that way. Well, listen, they're trying in pharmacy right now. Um, and pharmacy and hearing aids have been around for a while. You know, I have personal experience in it. You know, probably 10 years ago, we opened uh, 35 CVS hearing aid locations. In five months, we built these tiny six foot carts that would, you know, there was like a hearing aid. It was like a a bathroom for an airplane, build a audiology clinic that would roll into the, into, in front of the Hallmark card section of a CDS store. And we could see patients, uh, you know, with a, in privacy, which was pretty amazing. If I showed you the picture of this thing, but we sold a, a fair amount of hearing aids, a lot of hearing aids at regular retail prices in CVS stores with a licensed professional, um, doing, doing the testing, you know, obviously that didn't continue because they got a little greedy on, on, on their commissions and what they should take for rent. But the reality is that they went to open their own stores. They they've put now put OTC behind glass or, you know, an 800 number, whether it's Walgreens or CVS, they're not moving many products at all. Very, very few products. And it's not, it's, it's because it, it definitely still needs someone to kind of orchestrate the whole experience in some way. and kind of bridge that gap because we're not at the point yet that, Hearing aids are sexy and people want them. They're less of a handicap, which is great, which is really, really great. But they're not, people are not spending eight, nine hundred dollars in a CVS when the average, you know, for, uh, dollar amount of the cartridge is like $16.75. It's just not going to happen at that level. So some of the companies, whether you're Best Buy or some of these other companies that might have a professional that can at least guide people is going to have a better, you know, opportunity with it. And I agree with you. I think that they'll be a space for this, uh, and a large scale, uh, for, for people to, you know, obviously do it, but for the vast majority of the folks that are being taken care of today, and I can tell you this from talking to a lot of patients in our offices, they just don't believe that it can be that easy. They just don't. So the patients who are coming in and seen all the OTC commercials and directory the consumer commercials are like, how can they do that? You've, you see me every three or four or five months. You have to take the wax out. You have to clean it. You have to readjust it. How can I do that on my own? So again, there's, there's going to be a place for some of that, but the vast majority of folks realize that it, it's, it's care. It's the after care. It's the relationship. And as you said about my dad, those relationships go so deep. And when you get touch someone and show them you care so much, they will tell so many friends. It's amazing. It's, it, it really is when you do the right things and and everybody has the ability to do that. And you can't make it fake. You got to make it real. You got to, it's got to come from your heart and you never really got to do it. I'm not telling everybody learn how to go cook so you can bring food <laughs> in, but do something special for people. I remember Roy Bain years ago used to, uh, we did open houses with him. He used to make us go to a, 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 a nursery and buy all these little plants. And every person that came in left with a plant. Well, it was just a simple little thing. And those plants would stay in their house and the plants got bigger. And they would think of your hearing aid office when the plant got bigger. All those little things mean something, you know, you just have to find what it is, the niche that kind of, that really is your fingerprint and your touch and your marketplace that makes you unique. And, and, and that's, that's the fun of this business. You're using your entrepreneurial spirit to get you there and everybody possesses it. This is great. I really appreciate this conversation to kind of wrap up. Um, you know, let's, uh, just dive in real quick. Um, where do you sort of see this industry from your perspective, moving across the next, call it like three to five years, what do you think are going to be the big opportunities? What are the big challenges from the way that you see things? Yeah, I, I see the industry growing. I, I think OTC is still going to grow with it to a certain degree. We'll have a certain percentage of the, of the business, but I think um, I think large uh, large practices will continue to, to 
to kind of own the, the, the fair share of the marketplace. So I think there'll be some more consolidation within the retail sector. I think the retailers will get smarter in how to run their businesses, as we mentioned earlier. Um, I think the technology will continue to get um, stronger as well. I think there'll be one of the players uh, and the retail manufacturing that will develop the budgets to do some kind of national advertising marketing camp campaign that will put them in front of, of the rest of the folks. I think that's what's really missing these days for it to, for a household brand name to really distinguish itself within the space. Um, there's enough locations out there that that'll happen. I think the number one thing, as you mentioned a couple times earlier, is the HBMs, the hearing benefit managers of TPAs. They are in the, uh, the biggest uh, effect, the biggest focus um, that is occurring within, and maybe the biggest disruptor, if you will, uh, within the place. OTC is nothing compared to the TPAs and the HBMs because they are shaping the way that the hearing aid field is having to, to dispense the products and also affect the margins and uh, how we do business. And that's really affecting the business marketplace. You have uh, practices that have decided to, to be completely boutique that do not take any of those HBMs. And there's others that do 100% of it and still make a pretty good living. The, the question to you and to the to listeners out there is, what percentage of mix are you going to have in your practice to be successful? And I have my own you know, philosophies on where that should be, but that's going to be the big piece in the next three to five years, in my opinion. The number one thing will be how do you manage the managed care piece of it? Because that's what's really kind of um, affected us the most from more recently. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more with that. I think that um, it's, uh, you know, we kind of talked a little bit about it when we were out in Seattle is um, I, I think that it is kind of a business model issue um, that will have to be solved. I mean, the way I've sort of thought about this space is, you know, we're kind of currently um, we're kind of the old status quo was low volume patients, high margin product. And I think that with the three PAs, it kind of flips. It turns into more patients, like, but a depreciated profit margin, which to me doesn't necessarily mean anything more than we need to just, I think that people need to figure out how do you make a practice conducive to seeing more people knowing that your ROI for a patient is less, but you also need to factor in that whether you feel that those are your patients and that it, they came in your door through your marketing, the fact of the matter is there is definitely some depreciation of the customer acquisition cost as well. So you're not spending as much most likely to bring these people in. Um, but I, I just, I know that these are, they, they're all so variable based upon where you live, the kinds of insurance that exists. But to me, it seems as if the insurance piece isn't going away. Um, the, you know, we talk about the the silver tsunami and the baby boomers that are moving into retirement and moving into Medicare. Um, that's going to be huge. It's like all of those people are going to become eligible for Medicare. And therefore, they're going to, if Medicare has a hearing benefit like it does today, a lot of people are going to be using that. And so I think that's yeah. what we got to think through. The numbers don't lie. You get about 52% of the people who are over 65 on the Medicare Advantage program. And of those 52% of the people over 65 on the Medicare Advantage program, about 98% of them have a hearing aid benefit attached to their Medicare Advantage program. And the Medicare Advantage program is going to hit 65, 70% before you know it uh, in the next few years. So then that means all of those people have a Medicare Advantage benefit to the hearing aids. And they're going to be looking first to that uh, versus you know pursuing a marketing item that's directly sent to them or, or electronically sent to them uh, about pursuing hearing, they're always going to want to find out what that is um, at, at the lowest cost possible. The problem is, and this is something that was instilled in me as a, as a young person from my father, is that he said, Michael, you know, we, we need to treat everyone exactly the same way who needs a hearing aid. And that was instilled in me my whole life. And that didn't change until recently, and I hate to admit it, but it's because of the way these new programs exist. Because... You can't afford in your practice to give the same amount of time to a Medicare Advantage third-party payment fee-for-service model patient than you can with someone who's a private pay because you're getting six, five, four, four, five, six hundred dollars per year as a fitting fee to fit that hearing into the patient. You have, and then you get they get three allotted um, service checkup visits in that first year. That is a whole different philosophy on, on how you run your business versus a higher margin, low volume play like you mentioned earlier so you have to really dictate where you want your business wants to be and i tell you 
late night at after 11 o'clock at a hearing you can mention that's when you learn the most about your <laughs> True. My dad told me that when I was a kid. It's true. And then till wee hours of the morning, one, two in the morning, that's when you learn the most about the hearing industry. And these were these deep-rooted discussions about um, managed share and, and, and TPAs come, come about in philosophies on it. And uh, it, there's no simple solution, but it's more of a philosophy of how you're in practice. And I know I've, I know some real successful people who don't take any of this stuff at all and just run a private practice that is more of a boutique higher-end practice. And they do remarkably well. They just stay away from it. And then people are attracted to their practice in a certain way. And others think they have a boutique practice, but they really don't. Um, so it, it's really, again, it's back to looking at yourself in the mirror, understanding yep. what you have, and having someone maybe advise you on it. Because sometimes you, your blind is up. You just don't see it in your own practice. And you need someone to come tell you. Which is, a, I think, a testament to someone like you that you've always been very approachable and um forthcoming with your own wisdom that you've gained, uh, you know, as a young person in this industry, I've always really appreciated that, that you're willing to engage with someone like me and say, here's what I've learned. Um, and, and here's how I'm thinking about something like this. Cause to your point, um, you know, I don't even own a practice or anything like that, but it can be lonely in the sense that everybody is sort of heads down working on their own thing. And so I think that one of the things that really, I've mentioned this before on the podcast a bunch, but the thing that I gets me really excited about kind of the the time that we live in today is there's a lot of collaboration that's going on right now. There's a lot of dialogue that are in these kind of new channels that I think are really exciting. So last question, um, you mentioned you do the meatball reviews, best meatball that you've had <laughs> around the world. <laughs> and you can't oh say your dad's or something like that. That's cheating. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's cheating. You know, it's funny. Um, it's a place you wouldn't expect because I've had some great ones in Boston and New York and Rhode Island. Rhode Island's a mecca of food. Um, there's a restaurant in Rhode Island called Camille's Restaurant on Federal Hill, which is, it's a nine something, 9.45, six <laughs> incredible meatball. It's really great. But the best meatball I ever had, it's kind of funny. I was in San Diego, California. Really? I was with Ron and Roy Bain and we went to this restaurant called the Godfather Restaurant, which literally had red velvet on the wall. <laughs> there was a guy playing the organ when when I walked in, I thought I was going to get whacked or something. <laughs> and um, we ate dinner there, and the meatball was unbelievable. So I have to say that was probably that was the best meatball I ever had, and I, it was a place I didn't expect it the most. So, anyways, that's the best one. But there's a lot of other great ones that that are, that are out there. But thanks for asking. That's fantastic, Mike. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for everybody who tuned in here to the end. We will chat with you next time. Cheers. Thank you.